Good morning, everyone. I'm uh, Brian Schiffman, our president and CEO of the Bond Chamber of Commerce. Uh, it's my pleasure to welcome you to our CEO speaker series with what a fabulous guest, uh, wonderful entrepreneur, uh, well known to the Vaughn community and beyond. Um, formal introductions of Susan will come soon. So, uh, but I just say thank you personally on behalf of my team for joining us and uh, being a wonderful partner for the Vaughn Chamber over the years. Uh, today, um, I have the pleasure of uh, first just acknowledging our two longtime sponsors since day one of the CEO speaker series, and we've done so many great interviews over the years. Uh, so we have PwC and we have iSure Insurance. Um, we're going to hear from both of them soon. I'm going to take a moment to acknowledge uh, PwC uh, Luigi DeRose specifically because he's going to do the uh, the chat with me and Susan. We're going to do a fireside chat amongst the three of us. Uh, Luigi's a tax partner in private company services uh, at PwC and based in Vaughan. So uh, wonderful to uh, to have him here. And uh, Dario and Matt, you guys have been great. And Annie from PwC, I see you there too. Um, other than that, I want to get started. So I just recognize board members that are joining us today. Uh, we have Luis Cicerretto, our chair of the board from BDO Canada. Uh, Jeremy Neal, our vice chair from Ken Valen Management Corp. I saw Joe Pampina from C4C Coaching for Change, uh, Howard Clear from Harkel, Bobby Ann Wallace from Loopster Nixon, and Peter Sandica from Sterile Infection Control. So at this point, uh, I'm proud to turn it over to uh, our friends at iSure, uh, Dario and Matt, to uh, bring some opening remarks. And uh, I see Rachika uh, was good from our team to post in the chat to please put your comments in the chat. We'll do our best in the latter half of the segment to uh, to get to those questions. Um, so look forward to that. And uh, thank you to uh, to my spectacular team led by Jen and Lori, and Fio and Rachika and, and everyone who's done so much to make sure that the chamber has been uh, very strong during COVID. Uh, and obviously, Susan, we would have loved to do this in person, but uh, it's going to be fun virtually. Uh, over to you, Dario. Thanks, Brian. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Dario Batista. I'm founder and CEO of iSure Insurance Inc. Uh, we are a full service insurance brokerage right here in Vaughan, specializing in personal and commercial insurance services. Uh, but in addition to our core services, um, we've worked with Brian and the chamber to develop a discounted group home and auto insurance pro program exclusive to Vaughan Chamber members and staff. Uh, so I want to introduce Matt, who is one of our account executives, um, who will provide some additional details of the program, along with an exciting new giveaway that we're just going to be launching uh, and we're announcing for the first time today. Matt? Morning. Um, so our, our program that we have right now is great because there's a significant chance that you'll save on home and auto insurance firsthand at our office. The only opportunity to actually save um, on home and auto insurance as an, as an insurance broker is to um, hope that your office is part of one of these Chamber of Commerce programs. We partner with Economical and made an investment so that every Chamber of Commerce member and employee that contacts us for a quote will be entered into a draw. There are 36 prizes for $5,000. The first draw is July 1st this year. The last draw is June 1st, 2021. Uh, sorry, 2022. These will be happening, I believe, every six to eight weeks, depending on how many names are in the pot. Um, there is a significant chance if we have a lot of Vaughn Chamber members call our team, which will only take about two to four minutes for us to do a quote and enter your name, we could have dozens and dozens and dozens of our Chamber of Commerce community entered in and see multiple winners of $5,000. We're very, really excited about this. I'll be reaching out to different Chamber members. I have all the marketing pieces. You just have to tell your team. Um, that's the only big help piece that we're asking for. We want to make a big splash here and look really good and um, give a lot of money away to a chamber member. So again, Matt Eicher, uh, Matt at Eicher.ca um, and we'll have promo material going out next week. Thank you. Thanks, Matt. Um, yeah, just to really, we would love the opportunity to get in front of either your, your staff or your HR people. Um, this is a no cost perk that you can offer your staff and especially in these COVID times, anything that provides any premium relief, let alone the opportunity to win $5,000, I think is a, a real great value add um, to your staff. So we, we would love the opportunity to speak to you about it. Um, again, it's no cost to you and it's, uh, we, we have everything set to go. So uh, please reach out to Matt 
and that, that you know we'd love to hear from you. Um, so with that, I would like to now introduce our guest, uh, Susan Nichowski. I hope I got that right, Susan. I wrote it down phonetically to make sure I would get it uh, correctly. Uh, so Susan Nichowski is the founder and president of Summer Fresh Inc., an industry innovator in the food landscape. Uh, Susan is known for shaping the fresh gourmet food category as we know it today. With a Bachelor of Science in Chemistry, something I would never have gotten <laughs> with my educational background, but uh, so I always have uh, lots of respect for people who can get a Bachelor in Chemistry, uh, and a passion for food, there we definitely agree. Three decades ago, Susan identified the need for healthy, convenient, ready-to-eat consumer packaged foods. Summer Fresh was born with a mission to provide real food to consumers that they can feel good about eating. Since then, this family-owned company has become a staple in homes across North America, including my own, with, set, with healthy food options like small batch hummus dips, salads made from fresh, simple ingredients. Susan's food is fashion philosophy has made Summer Fresh the innovative brand it is today with trend-setting new and exciting flavors from season to season. After 30 years in the industry, both Susan and Summerfish have been recognized with a number of accolades and awards, including being named RBC Canadian Women Entrepreneur, top, uh, sorry, 100 top women entrepreneurs, and one of Canada's 50 best managed companies for over 22 years running. Susan is also the first winner of the Vaughn Chamber Women in Excellence Award. So congratulations on that. Susan is a longtime resident and supporter of the Vaughn community. So it is with great pleasure that I would like to introduce Susan Nachowski. Um, and I really look forward to, to the interview and uh, over to you, Brian. Thanks a lot, Dario. Uh, and I see that uh, you already have your first uh, entry for the contest, Khalid uh, said he wants Matt's phone number. Wonderful. So, uh, we'll put that in the chat. We'd, we'd love to talk to, we, we, we love giving away insurance companies money. So, look, you know, we the, made the investment and they're happy to, to do the draw. So let's look at let's, the bright uh, side. Look at the bright side. If Matt comes through and a Vaughn Chamber member wins $5,000, we'll certainly be promoting it. That, that We would love that. We'd love we'd multiple like members. So, all right. So thanks. Susan, it's my pleasure. Thanks, Dario. So Susan, thanks so much uh, for joining us and I'm going to get us started. And uh, we got Luigi DeRose from PwC here as well. Um, you know, when uh, anytime you look at a company, uh, in particular, a family owned business, it's always about the leadership and the people. So I think we got to start with you um, from the beginning and just ask you the straightforward question. Uh, can you tell us how Summer Fresh Salad uh, got started? Well, good morning, uh, Brian and Dario. Thank you for those kind words. Um, in 1991, I felt um, that there was a need in the marketplace for fresh prepared foods. Um, my mom and dad always told my sister and I to enjoy what you were doing. And I'm a true believer of loving what you do. Um, I tell my daughter that the courses you take, you should enjoy. Um, I tell my staff, if you get up in the morning and say, oh, I don't want to go to Summer Fresh today, then don't come through the, those doors and do something about it. I've always told myself the day you get up in the morning and don't want to come into Summer Fresh is the day you get out. If you're passionate about what you do, what you do and I'm very passionate, it feels like you're playing. Those 20 hour days only feel like four. Those seven days a week feels like one. In life, there will be challenges, some easy and some not, but that's what makes life extremely interesting. Over 40 years ago, I was 17 years old and I was vacationing in Acapulco, Mexico. We met a few people at the pool and started to chit chat. Um, I asked one of the teenagers, what does your dad do? She mentioned to me, he was an entrepreneur. I'm like, ooh, what's an entrepreneur? I had no idea. I came back from traveling and I looked it up in the Webster dictionary because in those days we didn't have a cell phone and we didn't have Google search. So, I was extremely intrigued with what the definition of entrepreneur was. We thought it meant a businessman. And when I looked it up, it was. At that time, I never thought that I would be an entrepreneur. 30 years ago, I felt there was a need in the marketplace for fresh, all natural, no additives, no preservative salads that were good for you, tasted great, and would eliminate labors at restaurants and grocery stores. 
let alone help us all eat properly. Health and wellness has always been a big part of my family and my life. In 1991, I went to RBC for a $50,000 loan. I got all dressed up. I wore a fur coat because it was in January. I had my briefcase because I wanted to look extremely professional. I went in and had a meeting. They asked me, what are you here for? I said, I'm here for a loan. I'm going to start up a salad company. They said, great, what's your business plan? I'm like, business plan? If I look at a buyer the wrong way, what does it matter? They asked me for collateral. I said I had $3,000 in my bank account, a 1982 Honda Accord and some jewelry I purchased with my part-time jobs. The account manager laughed and said, honey, your jewelry is not worth anything. Your car and cash is collateral, but not enough for your loan. You'll need a co-signer. I thanked the manager and said, my parents will co-sign. I get home Friday night and over dinner, my mom and dad asked me how the meeting went. I told them it was fantastic. I had this great account manager and she asked me all these questions and I answered them. And by the way, dad, can you please co-sign here? He said to me, hmm, absolutely not. I'm like, are you kidding me? You're not gonna sign for my loan? He said, no, I cried. I couldn't understand why my dad that gave me everything in life would not sign. He told me years later that it killed him to say no, but it was a life lesson for me. You need to know if I had a dollar, I would have spent two. That no taught me a life lesson. If you don't have it, you don't spend it. And in business, you need to watch your spend. You need to watch your leverage. You need to watch your debt to equity ratios. At the end of the day, my mom ended up co-signing for me. With my degree in chemistry and mathematics, I was able to come up with technology to create fresh prepared foods with no additives and no preservatives. Remember, this is 30 years ago. We developed 18 recipes. With my mom, Frances, being my foundation, we started Summer Fresh out of our home kitchen. Within a few weeks, we outgrew the home kitchen in Downsview. And we moved to a federally inspected facility at 910 Roundtree Dairy Road. My dad being the engineer drafted the plans at the plant, the drains, the floors, the kitchen. 30 years later, we have three state-of-the-art facilities with 800 employees. We're automated as much as we can. We still have a lot of manual labor in keeping with the homemade tradition and touch. Efficiencies, KPIs are all important to the operations. When I started my business, my dad gave me advice. You're only as good as your team. So don't be afraid to hire people that are smarter, wiser, and better than you. You can't know everything and you can't do it alone. For every successful products, we've had 10 products that have failed. They have failed because we were either ahead of its time or the consumers just didn't understand them. I'm a true believer in learning from your mistakes. As I joked about the business plan, it is important to stay on track. When launching products or being on budgets, try to stick to the plan as much as you can. As you grow and the team expands, you need accountability. There will be setbacks. Losing a customer, having products delisted, or the ever-changing landscape. Whoever would have thought a year ago we'd be living through a pandemic. With COVID, we've had to pivot our product selections. Food service items died as restaurants closed. Items being order, it had to be stopped. Uh, deli counters were closing, consumers were changing. They didn't want bulk items, they wanted prepackaged because they felt it was safer and better for them. Lessons learned, don't keep all your eggs in one basket, whether it's customers or products. Living through COVID, there have been many challenges, Empl employees being afraid, suppliers shorting raw materials, but together we've been able to make it work. We all love what we do. We've been very fortunate and have donated millions of kilos of products to the frontline workers that we are so grateful or, various, or to various food banks that are in need for food to our amazing employees that we would give the food basket so they felt safe and not to go and shop. Presently, we are proud to be Canadian. We support Canadian suppliers and farmers. We're female owned, family run, and we truly are believers of quality, consistency and innovation. We're the number one brand in Canada and we're thrilled to be engaged with you, the consumers and all consumers. Thanks, Brian. 
Well, thank you. I'm going to pass it to Louis, actually. Yeah, thanks, uh, Brian and Susan. Uh, I, I love the I love the tough love from from your father. I try to do the same with my kids, even though they think I'm a, I'm a mean guy sometimes. But uh, sometimes those tough tough loves are the best lesson. Um, two part question for you, Susan. Um, given that we're you know we're in a session with the Vaughn Chamber of Commerce and your business is based in Vaughn, I thought maybe you could talk about as your business grew, you stayed in Vaughn. Your plants are still in Vaughn, but. So why, why did you stay in Vaughan and not expand elsewhere or, or move, get a facility somewhere else? And then how do you maintain that freshness and no preservatives kind of ma mantra when you sell all over North America? Okay, um, yeah, you know, I grew up in Downsview uh, in Jane and Finch um, and the next uh, area that seemed um, there was opportunities was uh, Vaughan. Um, I felt that Vaughan was, um, centralized, you know, close to airports, um, Highway 400, 401, 407 um, is, you know, they're all easily um, accessible with regards to our trucks. Um, as we sell all across uh, North America, trucks coming and going both for raw materials um, and us shipping out finished goods, it's important that you're central to highways. So Vaughn was um, the perfect place for us. And um, being in the Pine Valley business uh, section, um, it really made sense for us to keep expanding um, in that location. Um, with regards to keeping our shelf life and, and keeping it fresh, I came up with technology to preserve vegetables um, that were natural. Um, so everything is made um, in our fresh refrigerated federally inspected facilities. Um, and it shipped all across North America with a shelf life. The product could last anywhere from 14 to 63 days. And we make to order, so everything is always fresh. Thanks, Susan. Um, I wanted to ask you about uh, meal delivery kits. Um, so I, I'm sure most of the members who are on here uh, are familiar with them, but just to sort of paint that picture, when you started in 1991, uh, you were on the cutting edge, and uh, but certainly there were no meal delivery kits. Um, in our house now, we have, uh, you know, it's more of a new trend. So we have, I'm just looking at some of the names, uh, the kids table, Hello Fresh, Good Food. And I'm wondering what you think about that new trend where people are having food shipped to their house that's healthy uh, and how that impacts summer fresh salads one way or the other. I think meal delivery kits are absolutely great. Um, there's the meal kits that are already prepared and easy for you. So you just have to eat up. And as we all have a crazy busy lifestyle, um, they're great, easy and good for you. Um, with regards to the good foods of the world um, and the meal kits, um, I, I'm a true believer that, you know, fr uh, food brings people together and it's about breaking bread. Um, so, you know, to make that 15, 20 minute meal together as a family is absolutely fantastic and you're eating great foods. So maybe Susan, if I'll pick up on that as well. So I think one of the you know big things we're seeing, at least I've seen for sure, uh, with uh, you know the, the pandemic and everyone being at home, is a lot more family time, a lot more cooking at home, a lot more eating at home. Um, so has, have you seen that as a big boom to to your business? That that you know this you know as Brian talked about these you know home meal kits. Um, and, and is that the big, I'll say the biggest quote unquote benefit from, to your business from COVID? And maybe what would have been the biggest challenge uh, that COVID presented to your business? So as um, you know, people are staying at home um, and you know, are not going out to restaurants, they're definitely uh, cooking um, a lot more. We found in the early stages of when the pandemic hit, so 14, uh, 15 months ago, um, people were, you know, making bread, baking, cooking, um, just eating what they can when they can. Um, we're just finding now um, as you know, people are getting bored, um, they're starting to eat healthier. Um, we found that our food service obviously closed down and our deli home meal replacement um, sections in the stores um, are starting to reopen and people are looking for that fresh, healthy food. So our business has been able to pick up um, where the other part of the business was, able, you know, was declining. Susan, I know that uh, I was, uh, I watched another interview that you gave and read a couple articles. Uh, can you talk about how you changed the size of your uh, products uh, because uh, people were uh, shopping less often? Let's say at Loblaws, right? Like I know in our family, we would not be going three times a week anymore. We'd go once every two weeks and we're looking to buy larger products. So 
how you changed your products and how you knew you had to do that. Yeah, so with the pandemic, I mean, you know, everybody was freaking out. Um, we were all afraid to go into the stores. Um, we didn't want to line up um, if we really didn't have to. So we found that, you know, through our market research and really trying to understand what was going on at retail level, um, people wanted larger pack sizes. So, you know, we decided to make larger pack sizes um, for the consumers and, you know, they seem to be take, taking off. Um, at the beginning of the pandemic, now we're finding that people want smaller pack sizes because they're not buying as much. So you've got to, you really have to understand your, your base and what the consumers want and need. And how do you, so how do you interact with your consumers to, to get that feedback on a regular basis? Because I, I can see you're constantly needing to evolve, especially during COVID. Yeah, so um, I'm a true believer in going into the stores and seeing what's going on, um, you know, looking at people's baskets and seeing what's inside their baskets. Um, you know, these days we are able to purchase that data and we analyze the data. We've got um, four people on our team analyzing um, the numbers and seeing what consumers are purchasing and what they're buying with, you know, a hummus, a dip, a salad. Are they buying potato chips? Are they buying vegetables? Are they buying bread? Are they buying pasta? Um, so we've got a whole uh, team that does that research and then gets, get ba gets back to the team and we analyze accordingly. Okay, great. And, and, and Susan, what, what challenges have you had um, with staff? Like you're an essential service, obviously, so you've been able to make, stay open throughout the pandemic. Uh, I assume obviously we have, you know, the, all the right measures, distancing it within the plant, et cetera. But what, what challenges have you faced and what challenges have your employees faced continuing to come to work during, during COVID? Oh my God, the last uh, several months or the last 14 months have been absolutely um, a different uh, year and extremely challenging. My hair was going like this at all times. Um, you know, every decision that I made, I had to uh, consider, you know, the 800 families that I employ. Um, the employees that I thought, you know, were, were strong and were going to be by my side uh, were weak and were afraid to come in. And the other employees that I thought were weaker really stepped up to the table and were able to grow um, and really help out. Um, you know, having a background in, in science um, and, you know, living through SARS uh, 18 years ago, we implemented masks in our facility you know, in February, um, and we made sure that we had the guards um, in, in our facilities as soon as we can get them made. Um, we, we checked temperatures of all the employees, um, you know, way back when, before they even told us uh, what to do. Um, I, again, we, we, we always try to put and be in front of um, the employees and making sure they feel safe. And, and do you, and how do you think that's gone over? Extremely well. Um, you know, the employees have written to me or called me or um, have come into, uh, into my office to say, you know, thank you for what you're doing. At the beginning of the pandemic, you know, we gave every employee food boxes. So um, they didn't have to go in the store and they didn't have to line up um, and they were forever grateful. Um, a couple of weeks ago, you know, we organized a pop-up uh, vaccine clinic to make sure that all of our employees um, were vaccinated. Um, we also, you know, do quick um, testing for all of our employees to make sure that, you know, nobody's carrying the, uh, the virus and they feel safe, they feel good. No, I think, I think that's the best, uh, the best statement that you can get when you get that positive feedback from your team and you help them feel safe and you know you're doing a good product. Um, let's talk a little bit about the dichotomy of the Canadian economy and that uh, we have such a educated uh, population and yet we have such a uh, dire need for skilled trade workers and uh, those in manufacturing and production plants. Um, has this been a challenge for you uh, before and during COVID to find the right employees and retain them? Yes, um, our retention level is actually quite good. Um, and I'm very proud of it. Um, you have to keep in mind our facilities are cold and wet. Um, and when I say cold, I mean refrigerated. Um, but at the same time, we're finding that the pool of employees that are available are limited. Um, you know, there are companies that are offering, you know, double the amount of hourly wages. And how do you justify that? It's a hard one for us. 
I, I'm just reading some of the comments as I see them in the chat here. I, I just like to challenge our members. Uh, I like what you're saying about how you love Susan's different products. Love. So I'm looking, for instance, at what Johnny wrote. Why don't you pull this stuff out of your fridge and uh, start eating it while we're on camera? Not you, Susan. Ironic. Oh, I'm like, oh my God, <laughs> do I have product in my fridge? Oh, no, I not you. <laughs> you're supposed to log in and just put in a credit card. <laughs> Enzo, I think I think we can hear you. Are you gonna you're gonna log in and put your credit card and buy Susan's products? <laughs> I love you, Enzo. That. Keep buying. Keep buying. Uh, Louie, over to you. Yeah, um, Susan, I was going to pick up on a comment in the chat as well. Uh, is there any are there any new de product products in development that you can share? And have you thought about expanding into sweets, desserts? Oh, good question. Um, we're always uh, innovating. Um, we always, you know, part of our uh, tagline is uh, food is fashion. So as a fashion industry, you know, brings out uh, new clothing, new colors down the runway for, you know, fall, spring, summer, and winter, uh, we do the exact same thing. So we're constantly innovating and seeing what the consumers want. Uh, we do have some prepared foods that are coming uh, down the pipeline. Um, and we're hoping to have those uh, listed in the uh, grocery stores and the small specialty food stores for uh, middle of August and into September. Um, they're great, healthy uh, products that are extremely comforting. Um, so uh, stay tuned. Um, we do have some new products right now. I mean, my passion for potato chips and yes, I do eat healthy, but I do love potato chips as well. Um, we came up with two exciting hummus flavors um, that are similar to potato chips, salt and vinegar and uh, dill pickle, which just uh, launched in the last couple of weeks um, in your favorite uh, refrigerated deli section. So those are two new items that uh, are really fun and good for you. Uh, with regards to desserts, um, we launched desserts uh, about five, six years ago. And um, it was one of those products that consumers weren't willing to, to pay for. They were fabulous. They were great. They were minis, um, but we were just ahead of our time. That was a flop. So would you say, would you say uh, on that point, would you say that you've had a lot of flops over the years and do you, do you I assume you learn from them, but um, is it just trial and error? Like how, how do you find a successful product? Years ago, it was like, you know, what I felt um, was good, we would launch. Uh, those days are gone. So now we do a lot of market research um, and make sure that, you know, the consumers are ready for them. Um, the stores want them, the buyer um, at store level is interested in them, and we've got uh, data to back it up. Um, but absolutely, for every successful product, we've probably had 10 flops. And, and where do you, where do you cut, like, when do you know to cut the cord? Like, when, when do you realize that the product is a flop? Is it after five or six months of tried sales a year? Just curious what, you know, what, what you think about to say, you know what, let's cut the cord, let's pull that product. It's a hard decision to make, especially, you know, when you're so passionate about the products and the products that you're developing and are launching. Um, but if something's not selling, um, absolutely, you're going to have to cut the cord and uh, take the losses and move on. Never look back. You just got to keep moving forward. And at the same time, learn from your mistakes. Susan, maybe I'll, I'll, I'll jump in on that and I'll flip the question. How, how do you know when a product's successful? When it keeps selling. <laughs> um, and, you know, with social media now, you got, um, you know, people emailing you, um, tagging you, uh, posting how wonderful and great and yummy the products are. But at the end of the day, it's all about uh, sales. I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about, uh, because I, I think it's interesting for our audience about some of your private label uh, efforts uh, relative to, because when you go into the store, people know the Summer Fresh Salads brand. Um, but in terms of the private label, maybe you could give us a little bit of insight as to what that looks and feels like for Summer Fresh Salads. So I'm a true believer in, um, you know, manufacturing um, Summer Fresh brand. That's what we own. And, you know, that's what the company um, stands for. Um, but private label is absolutely amazing and great. And we're very fortunate that we manufacture probably all the private label that's out in the Canadian marketplace. Um, and we treat the two uh, very similar. They're, you know, they're both our, our babies. Um, and we've been able to grow both private label and the brand uh, together, uh, double digit sales year after year. Oh, congratulations, that's great. 
Uh, and um, it would be worthwhile to go into your food as fashion mantra. You did refer to it, but it's, it's always worth asking the owner and the founder what that means to, to you. What does it mean to you, food as fashion? Can you give an illustration? Absolutely. As uh, you know, as the fashion industry brings out, you know, different scarves or different bags or different pants or different ties, um, we bring out different flavors and different products um, and we're constantly innovating. Um, so, you know, Italian and pesto was really hot 30 years ago, whereas Asian fusion and yuzu is, uh, is popular today, um, as is you know, vegan products and nut products, which we've got uh, out, in the, out in the marketplace with our nutty dips. Susan, one of the questions in the chat that I'll pick up on just on the private label uh, commentary, if I'm reading the question correctly, is as a consumer, when I'm at a supermarket shopping for product, how, if I see a private label salad, how, how would I know that it's Summer Fresh Salads product? You won't. Um... You won't because that private label is made, um, you know, with an exclusive recipe uh, for that particular uh, brand. Um, yeah. And then the other, another question in the chat is, um, if a product flops, do you ever consider revisiting the product as consumer tastes evolve? Absolutely, um, absolutely. So we're always looking at our library of recipes that we've created 30 years ago, 20 years ago, you know, two years ago and see if we were just too ahead of our time uh, for that flavor um, or that product. Um, and we try to bring it back. A good example is, you know, we launched a, a queso dip probably about eight years ago and it was a flop and we just mm -hmm. recently launched it and it, you know, seems to be taking off because Mexican food in Canada is, um, is on the rise and people understand the product. Uh, Susan, when we had uh, Chris Pfaff in our CEO series from FAF Automotive, I asked him the same question I'm gonna ask you, which is, I said to Chris, and it's a good question for a lot of CEOs, uh, you're, you're dependent on your suppliers to a fair extent uh, to build consumer confidence. So if there is a problem in the supply chain, it's Summer for Salads or it's FAF Automotive that has to uh, try and reassure confidence. Um, so I'm wondering how does Summer Fresh Salads uh, deal with this issue and make sure they can reassure confidence if there is a problem in supply chain, for example, uh, a product recall? Yeah, great question, Brian. Um, absolutely. So, you know, we try to um, create and develop a relationship with all our, our suppliers and we don't flip flop our suppliers. Um, so, you know, through the years, our suppliers are consistent. Um, we do audits to ensure that, you know, the places are what they're supposed to be. Um, and, you know, we've got a strong quality assurance department that double checks all the raw materials coming in. That's not to say that, you know, errors don't occur. Um, we're all human um, and shit's going to happen. Um, but how do you avoid it? How do you not bring it into the plant? How, you, how do you not bring it into the facility? Well, fair so enough. Oh, sorry, go ahead. No, so, so there's definitely a strict um, requirements to be one of our suppliers and you've got to meet all the criteria and all the products coming in, whether it's a box, a label, um, raw material have to meet um, the proper specifications and they get tested prior to uh, entering our facility or there's a certificate of analysis that gets sent in. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, it, it's not a bad time to, I want to, I see Elvira Carey, our, uh, our uh, celebrity superstar who did our women's symposium is, has joined us. So I'm going to go to her question in the chat. She says, can Susan speak to perhaps her entrepreneurship journey as a female entrepreneur in a, veil, in a very male dominated industry? Uh, was she taken seriously? Were there obstacles? If so, how did she break through them? Amazing question. Um... Absolutely. Um, you know, it is a very much a male um, industry. Um, I was young. Um, people didn't um, believe in me. They wanted to deal with my male counterpart or my male boss. Um, for the longest time on my business cards, I had put quality assurance manager um, on them because they wouldn't take me seriously if I had sent a president. Um, through the years, I had to prove myself. Um, you know, I love what I do. I've been extremely um, upfront and honest, and I think it's all about integrity. Um, 
and you know, you, I have a certain track record. Um, if I say something, then it's done. Um, I'm a great listener. Um, you know, and I think integrity is an important part of a true entrepreneur. Uh, that, that's good, Susan. Uh, thanks. That's uh, very inspirational. I, I want to go back to the recipes uh, for a second. So when you started, you talked about doing, you know, uh, working on recipes with your mother in, in your home kitchen and then, you know, got a small facility in, in Woodbridge. How, how involved are you still in the actual development of recipes? Are they, are they still a lot of them your babies or do you kind of, you know, have staff that develop them and maybe you're part of the quality control team to use the phrase you just use and you just taste test them. Just curious how, how that's evolved over time. So we've got a research and development uh, team um, that creates products all day long. Um, you know, our, uh, our director of R&D um, creates recipes with his team, um, but we as ma a management team do taste our products on a daily basis, um, even though our quality assurance uh, group has approved them and, you know, they're going down the pipeline. Um, every day at 11.30, we taste products. And that's great, Luigi, I, I feel that's important for me because I'm a true believer in, you know, standing for our products. Um, our quality assurance team has a trained palette. Our research and development team is creating the products. But at the end of the day, um, you know, us as management are responsible for the products when we're in front of a consumer or a buyer. Um, so I truly feel good when we have products out in the marketplace and what we stand for. So just to pick up on that, because uh, it sounds like you're, you know, very close to the to the product, which which is great. When you go to Indigo, there's Heather's picks. This, you know, the book she loves. Is there a Susan's picks? <laughs> is there a favorite product of two of yours that, that you love? Um, absolutely. Um, you know, I eat depending on my mood and the weather, so it really depends on what day and you know what the sunshine is like outside, or if it's hot or cold. I mean. I eat a lot more salads in the summertime than I do in the winter. Um, but yeah, every day, you know, there's something fun and interesting. I really enjoy, you know, the original hummus and our uh, baba ganoush. There's a, there's a question in the chat. Did your dad eventually invest? Ah. <laughs> um, I, I have a follow-up on that question. question? <laughs> um, absolutely. Absolutely. He supported me, you know, for the longest time when, uh, you know, when I started Summer Fresh, I would make sure that all my employees were getting paid and I wasn't getting a paycheck. Um, so, you know, living at home, um, my mom and dad supported me for the longest time. Susan, there was a question in the chat. Um, it says, do you feel that your mother co-signing that initial loan took away from the lesson your father wanted to convey? No, not at all. Um, because you have to remember, if I had a dollar, I, I would spend two, you know, um, and then that taught me a lesson that you can't keep spending um, and you're going to have to save. Um, I remember starting, you know, Summer Fresh at the beginning and um, I had a $20 allowance um, and I had to pay for gas and I would go to Tim Hortons every morning and buy a, a cup of coffee and I went to my mom oh my god I can't afford this coffee so I bought a coffee maker and started making coffee so it was a, it was a great lesson for me. What, and what about as a follow-up how did you ensure that you kept within your means uh, early on? Even to this day uh, everybody you know in my um balloon at Summer Fresh knows if we don't have the money, uh, we don't buy the stuff and we don't spend. Um, I still pick up paper clips from the floor um, because, you know, those are pennies. I'm, yeah, and, I, and I'm not, um, I'm not thrift. It's just, you know, if we don't have it, we don't spend and don't spend foolishly. Like this morning, I got an email that my lemon juice was leaking in the plant. And I'm like, come on, guys, that's costing us money. So, I mean, you have to stay, you know, you have to watch that. You have to watch every single penny. Yeah, it's good advice. You know, it's funny. My five-year-old would be thrilled. She'd think that'd be a great game to come to your plant and pick up the paper clips. So we'll do that after COVID. Absolutely. And rubber bands. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, and what about, what's it like uh, working with family? I mean, you have a great dynamic with your mother. That's clear. Uh, you do work with your sister. Um, 
that must be, uh, we, we talked to a lot of family businesses. Many chamber members are family run businesses. So can you talk about the challenges and, and what's great about that? We have a very close family uh, dynamics, but um, when we have heated discussions, they're heated. Um, you know, we're very passionate about the business. Um, there's been many times when, you know, a family member will say, take it outside because you shouldn't be yelling and screaming in front of, uh, you know, the team. Um, we, we love each other. Um, you know, we laugh, we scream, we shout, we swear. It's, it's part of life. Uh, if it's okay, Louis, what I'd like to do is, is let Dario ask his question about scaling, just because he's yeah. one of the sponsors. Yeah, I was going to pick that up, but yeah. He'll word it. Dario, did you want to? Yeah, go ahead. Sh sure, thanks. Um, Susan, really interesting chat. Thank you. Uh, I was curious on the scaling. So, I mean, in my world, I've dealt with many businesses, small, medium, and large companies, obviously in dealing on the commercials, uh, on the insurance side. And one thing I've noticed is many small companies want to grow, but when they get into that mindset of wanting to scale, it is a difficult task and obviously uh, often a much more difficult task than many leaders really fully comprehend because running an 800 person firm is very different than out of the kitchen with your mom. And so as you went, you know, you've done it successfully and not many can do it successfully. What, what have, how have you evolved as a leader and, and do you have any learnings that you could pass on in terms of things you've seen and done? Uh, one comment you made earlier was about hiring people and not being scared to hire good people, but you know, it's more than that. It's, it's, uh, it, it's a, so can you speak a little bit about, about your journey uh, as a leader? Yeah, Dario, um, great question. Um, you know, you have to be a visionary. Um, you know, don't be afraid to hire experienced, um, great people um, that know more than you um, and that have been there, let's say in, in larger industries and, and can really bring, you um, great ideas and great concepts and great technology into our facilities. Um, that being said, um, you know, making a potato salad or a Greek pasta salad in a hundred kilo batch is very different than a thousand kilo batch. So you have to be prepared um, to understand what it's gonna take and how we're going to do it. Um, sure, we've made mistakes uh, where we you know, we didn't think we would grow as fast as we did. Um, and we've, you know, we've shorted products, um, but then you learn from your mistakes and you, you know, you put um, equipment in place where you can to make sure that you've got um, growth opportunities. Um, you know, that business plan that I joked about 30 years ago when my, you know, account manager at the bank asked me for it, um, you know, we sit down on a monthly basis and look at the projections and what that means to the plants and what it means to our raw material suppliers. Um, and how do we make sure that, you know, we can grow accordingly. And it's been difficult, um, but you have to, you know, you know, you have to have that two year, three year, five year plan. If I could just jump in. So as a follow up, so is, is part of the journey uh, becoming like, gaining that awareness of the increased level of sophistication as you go, like it can't be by gut feel anymore. It, it, you, you start having to, to, to really having to get deeper into the organization, having people who can provide you that information so you can make the, make the proper decision going forward. So it's getting a lot more professional, if you will, uh, in terms of your approach around the business from perhaps where you started with no business plan and, um, you know, and, and you look at you today and it, you're clearly very structured and very, um, uh, um, you know, focused in terms of strategy, is, is that part of the journey, becoming more more uh, sophisticated in just your management style? Um, you know, everybody's got um, you know a, a, a job, um, and they've got to you know make sure that what they're hired uh, to do, you know, they keep in within their responsibilities. Um, you've got to grow with the times. Um, you know, a a mixer or a chopper that you know was great for us 30 years ago making 10 kilos of products is a little bit different than you know manufacturing a hundred thousand kilos um, of product um, yeah you have to move with the times technology is important um, and you have to keep um, putting back into the business um, to get things out and then you have to you know you have to be more structured so the days of you know, doing what you wanted to do are gone. Um, you know, you've got to put in KPIs and making sure that your employees um, understand 
what you want and what's needed and what they're responsible for. Susan, I, I want to change gears a little bit and talk, you know, hopefully we'll end this pandemic shortly and people will be back kind of to normal, whatever that new normal is. H how do you see that changing your business, your workforce? Do you see people going back in the plant, in the office, doing what they were doing? Or do you see a change with what, you know, how your employees work, how, where they work, et cetera? So our plant has been, um, you know, has been running uh, all the time during the pandemic. We didn't have employees from the plant work from home because it's virtually impossible. You can't make a salad at home um, or a dip. Um, our office set team, um, we have had a hybrid um, work schedule. Um, you know, everybody talks that, you know, they can work from home, but it's difficult. You've got children that are at home and, they, you know, you're trying to babysit them, but you're also trying to work. I got the dog, you know, that's talking to me. I got the doorbell working. So I found that it's extremely difficult to be communicating um, while people are working at home. I have brought our, our employees back um, a few times um, and it's, it's great. Um, it, it's going to be interesting to see what the, uh, what the future entails. Um, I'd love to see everybody back in the office. You know, we really need to see people's facial expressions. I don't know about you guys, but, you know, by 536 o'clock being on Zoom or Teams, I'm dead. I'm fried. I'm speaking a lot louder. I can't see people's facial expressions. Um, you know, being in sales, you have to be in front of that person. You have to be face to face to understand it. I think everybody's going to need glasses by the time COVID's over. Too much staring at a screen. Uh, I love Andrea's question. I'm going to read it to you uh, how she posted it in the chat. Uh, having a business is tough, but managing employees seems to be the most challenging of all tasks. What insight do you have in dealing with not with staff who are happy, but rather those who tend to complain more often or, or, or who are more challenging to manage? Great question, Andrea. Um, I always try to treat um, you know, employees the way I want to be treated and, um, you know, being the driver on the bus, you got to keep those wheels moving. Um, so, you know, I try to make them feel like the negative is a positive and, you know, it's not as bad as you think, and we're going to keep moving forward. Um, in my eyes, the glass is always, uh, you know, half full and it's not half empty. Um, and at the end of the day, if they're not happy, um, you know, getting up every single day, um, you know, maybe Summer Fresh is not the place for them. Um, that's not to say that, you know, they have, you know, they don't feel down at times. It's just, you know, is it something that's temporary or are they down 24 seven? Well, so a uh, quick follow up on that. So how do you manage employee satisfaction? Like you, you referenced KPIs so that could, theoretically be one way, but are there other ways that you can uh, effectively measure and know? Because you have so many employees, you have 800 employees, so you can't know what everybody's thinking. So how do you measure that? Um, at the end of the day, we look at, you know, our efficiency levels and is the output where it should be? And if it's not, why isn't it? Um, you know, you try to speak to the supervisors and the lead hands. Um, and, and as I said at the beginning of the conversation, our turnover is not that high. So we know a lot of our employees, we treat them like family. There's gonna be good days and bad days, but at the, end of the, at the end of the day, we hope they have a lot more good days and bad days. Susan, what advice do you give your kids and, and you know, the next generation? Do, do you want them to take over the business? Do you say, do whatever you wanna do? Like what, what what do you tell your kids about getting involved in the, in, in the business? So I have a daughter, uh, Stephanie, um, you know, who will be graduating from grade 12 in the next couple of weeks. Um, I always say to her, you know, take the courses that you love because um, then you'll love doing what you want to do. Um, you know, I love what I do. I get up in the morning and I look forward in going into work. Um, whether, you know, she will join the business or my two nieces will join the business is up to them. They have to be extremely passionate. They have to understand the business. And I would have them, should they be interested um, in the business, you know, get it, get onto the plant floor and really understand the business from the bottom up. Susan, do you think, uh, <clears throat> well, I guess I should frame this. I know online sales is a big area of growth for groceries. I talked to uh, Joe Daddario from Nature's Emporium about that. Um, 
do you see that as something Summer Fresh Salads will, will get into? Because right now you have this incredible website. Obviously, I can't order products on the website. So that's what I'm really asking you. Is that an area that uh, your company is looking at? Um, we've looked at it in the last uh, few years. We have a Summer Fresh market that's temporarily closed because of COVID. Um, hopefully, it'll be opened uh, in the next few months once, uh, you know, things open up. Um, E-commerce for us um, is a possibility, but shipping refrigerated products is extremely expensive and difficult um, in Canada. So, you know, we're always looking at more efficient, more effective, more cost-effective ways, um, you know, to ship products. So we'll see. Yeah, fair enough. It's, a, it's an interesting, boy, uh, it's a huge topic in and of itself, right? And I'm sure you've spent a lot of time on that. Uh, I mean, we, we see you know, online sales in the U.S. Um, growing, you know, triple digits. Um, but to ship products in the U.S. is a lot more economical than it is in Canada. So hopefully um, we will find more efficient, cost-effective ways to ship. Yeah, well said. Um, there's a question in the chat, uh, probably I assume a mom uh, in, in, in the audience, is how do you get kids to eat your healthy products knowing that kids are picky eaters? Oh, they're so picky. Um, you know, for the longest time, my daughter would not eat hummus. Um, and through trial and error, trial and error, now she's the biggest fan. So I'm a true believer in, you know, getting them to sample a little bit at a time. And then um, through time, they will learn to enjoy the products. Uh, Susan, I have one. Um, it's, it's about... Um, changing dynamics as you scale and the changing dynamics of what you need in a, in a team member. So what is your approach to hire people that fit your company as well as your growth? Um, obviously, you know, they've got to have um, what it takes to be part of the team and they really have to fit our environment. Um, you know, I really go based on um, my gut feeling and if they will fit our environment. Um, I've been fortunate that I've got um, a great way of reading people. Um, they're either a good fit or a not good fit. You're not you're not personally involved in most of these interviews, though, are you? No, no. I, I would hope not. <laughs> no, those days <laughs> are gone. You have to train the right people to hire yeah. them. Yeah. Um, Louis, did you want to ask? Uh, we have a little bit more time. Did you want to ask uh, any of these some of these questions in the chat? Yeah, I'm looking at, I think we got through, did we get through most of them? Just scanning through it. Uh, I liked uh, El Elvira's recent one was really good. We're, I think oh, okay, me and Louie are doing a good job. We're trying to see the chat. I got uh, WhatsApp messages from Rachika. She's doing a great job. Um, up to you, Louie. Yeah, okay, let me read, I'll, I'll read this one ver verbatim from uh, Elvira in the chat. So how important is marketing and advertising your business? That's the first part. You're an established brand by now. So does advertising still play a key role in brand development? And what type of advertising has worked best for you? So yes, uh, marketing is extremely important to our organization. Um, you know, it's all about the brand being, you know, first and foremost in, in people's eyes and mouths. Um, in terms of, you know, how we move forward with regards to um, our marketing strategy really changes. Um, you know, we've done TV, radio, um, social media, um, magazine, print, newspaper. So it really varies. Um, we, we try to do all sorts of um, advertisements. Um, as the consumer is ever evolving, um, we're evolving with it. How important, because, uh, you know, uh, Brian's question was about online and, and selling directly to consumers on, on your website. So you're selling directly in supermarkets right now. How important are things like shelf space, where you're, where you're situated on a shelf, uh, in-store advertising, uh, et cetera? Very important. Um, you, know, you know, your product has to be placed um, in the proper plan. First of all, the product has to be um, listed um, and it has to be put um, in the proper planogram. And uh, absolutely, depending on you know where the product is on shelf is extremely important. Important. So product placement, um, you know, has to be there for you. And I'm a true believer that you know your product has to talk to you. So 
you know, my green package speaks to you and it's not just speaking to you, it's got to yell at you saying, grab me, buy me, because that's what's going to, you know, get you to take my product um, for the first time, then it's, you know, up to us as manufacturers to make sure that that product tastes good day in and day out. And it should be as consistent as, as consistent as raw materials can be. So a red pepper is going to be a little bit different today than it is in January, depending on what field it comes from. But we've got specifications put in place to make sure that the quality is consistent. Susan, I, I know we're running a little bit short on time, but I did want to follow up on Louis's question. I thought it was fabulous. Um, just in terms of what is the dynamic? How do you negotiate for preferred shelf space in one of the retail uh, centers where you're selling your product? Oh, I think this will take about five hours to uh, I know, explain. I know, but I, really, um, <laughs> I can't let you go without asking this because it's such an interesting topic, right? Yeah, it's very interesting. Um, yeah, a lot of data. Um, you got to look at, you know, what the marketplace needs, you know, how your brand uh, speaks, um, what the category stands for. Um, it's a very difficult uh, answer. All right, we'll have you back. Good question. <laughs> But, um, can I ask you quickly, Stacy from uh, Fruit of the Land asked approximately what percentage of sales is dedicated to advertising and marketing, if, if you're able to share that. Well, we're a private company, so we don't divulge that. Okay. And um, how, uh, last question, um, just about price sensitivity. Uh, to me, when I look at your products, uh, this is uh, like you're a market leader in this field, like on, on salad and sort of the food is fashion trend, um, but price sensitivity is relevant to all products. So how do you ensure your prices are um, in line with what the market will pay? Um, great question. Um, absolutely, product pricing is extremely sensitive. Um, you know, there's a certain percentage of consumers that, you know, really need to watch their spend. Um, so, you know, we wanna make sure that you know, that price point is suitable for all consumers. Um, but yeah, there's a certain threshold that the consumer will accept versus not accept. Um, so we look at that. We look at price sensitivities, um, a high-low strategy in every day, um, price strategy. We analyze that on a weekly basis. I'm just going to uh, li listen. I'm going to pass it over to Louis to to close us out. But I wanted to thank our audience because we got so many great questions. Susan, the 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 quality of the conversation was fabulous. I mean, clearly we knew we could have gone two three hours on a topic uh, on a set of topics like this with a great leader like you. And uh, it's you've been wonderful to work with at the chamber. Um, before Louis closes it, let me just put a final question to you. Is there one piece of advice that you'd like to impart to other leaders that are on this call? Because CEO series is always about imparting some advice to get us through challenges. And right now everybody's going through such a tough time. So I'll put it to you and then I'll ask Louie to close. Yeah, um, Brian, you know, absolutely. Um, you have to believe in your product. Um, and, you know, there, there might have to be, you know, the, the road to get there might be a little different because, you know, times are extremely challenging. Um, and you have to learn, you know, we've heard the word pivot um, in the last whatever 14 months, but you really do have to pivot um, as, as we did our food service uh, team, um, you know, got hit really hard, but then our retail team had to, uh, you know, come to come to the party and had to change things around slightly. So you always have to be evolving. Um, you have to keep moving and you have to really understand what your consumer really wants. Thanks, Susan, um, and thanks, Brian, uh, for the opportunity to uh, co-lead this discussion uh, with Susan uh, with you. So on behalf of my uh, partners and uh, colleagues at PwC who are on the line and back at uh, the office in Vaughan, virtually, obviously, not in person, uh, I'd like to thank Susan Nachowski for that fantastic discussion. Susan, as Brian said, with, you know, the conversation could have gone easily another hour. Uh, you've been uh, great and, and very candid uh, with ship. your responses, so I appreciate that. Um, as Brian said, PwC has been a proud sponsor of this uh, series, the CEO Speaker Series since uh, day one. And we would like to continue that sponsor sponsorship uh, with the Vaughan Chamber of Commerce. Quick plug for PwC. Uh, many of you know us as a professional services firm that offers uh, auditing and tax uh, work or tax advice to clients. Uh, but we do much, much more than that. 
Um, we we are dealing with clients on upskilling their workforce in the post-pandemic world, uh, offering cybersecurity support, which has a, a bit, become a big issue for businesses. Um, so I encourage uh, the private businesses that are out there to reach out and talk to us. Uh, we'd be happy to hear from you and to, to work with you in, in solving in, uh, your, your issues and helping you continue to grow. So with that, Brian, I'm not sure if I'm turning it over to you, if I'm just uh, closing here, but thanks to everyone.